take a look around you on this planet, and you'll see that we are surrounded by the extraordinary. From flowers, insects, to animals, our world is filled with incredible creatures. But how did all this come into being? Was it an accident? A product of random chance? Or is there another explanation? Hi, I'm David Haynes, and in the next few minutes, we're going to enter the world of incredible creatures and see what they have to tell us. I want to introduce you to Dr. Job Martin. Dr. Martin was a traditionally trained scientist with an extensive education. Majored in biology and music at Bucknell University, went off to dental school, University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And when I got out of dental college, I was agnostic. I didn't know if God existed or not. I was uh, looking into Zen Buddhism. Uh, which is all you ever do with that, really. You just keep looking into it. And I was uh, an evolutionist through and through. During the Vietnam era, Dr. Martin served President Johnson aboard Air Force One as part of the 89th Military Airlift Wing. Later, as a dentist, he became a university professor and was a committed evolutionist. So when I think back about uh, how was I taught evolution, and basically it started with the Big Bang, and then all of a sudden, over millions of years, somehow or another, in this primordial soup, a speck of life popped up. And that speck of life over, really now they say about three billion years, the speck of life finally became a living cell, a living reproducing cell. And then that cell became everything that we see. And so I was taught that all the life that we see out there, plant, animal, whether it's a paramecium or a pine tree, it all came from that first little speck of life. But Dr. Martin's worldview was about to be totally shaken when, as a professor, he was challenged by two of his students. Two of my students came up and challenged me with my evolutionary thinking. So we started studying, and they took me to some of the assumptions that the evolutionists make that I had never been taught, and the students still are not taught. I've been asking them around the country, do you know the assumptions behind this dating technique? No, there are no assumptions. That's just fact. No, there are assumptions. So they're still not taught the assumptions. Okay, this is today. Uh, so, we looked at the assumptions, I began to see they're not valid. Then we began to study little animals, because I was a biology major, love animals, love to study animals. And we studied the vomiter beetle, we went to other animals, and then I began to see there's absolutely no way that this little creature, whatever it is, could be here as a result of some sort of a slowly progressing process. You don't have a partial lung or a partial liver or a slowly developing uh, brain in that sense, or a slowly developing uh, uh, posture. It has to be all there at one time. And if it isn't there all at one time, you have a dead animal. Today, Dr. Martin lectures students all over the country about his remarkable findings on these animals. They are giant mammals that live in the ocean but must have air to breathe. They can consume over 5,000 gallons of air per minute and can weigh up to 300,000 pounds. Their tongues alone can weigh as much as an elephant. And when they swim on the surface, they can generate the power of three muscle cars. They are whales, the giants of the deep. It's the biggest animal that was ever created, as far as we know. We don't have any fossils of any dinosaurs that are bigger than the biggest blue whales. 100 feet long, 300,000 pounds. The tongue can weigh as much as an elephant. You might have 22 tons of blubber. I mean, we're talking tons, not pounds. But whales are not only massive in size, they are complex in their design. The humpback whale, which is the one with the big fins, those fins are like the ears on the elephants. Those fins act as air conditioners because the humpback is in shallow water, which is warmer, and then in deeper water, and it's going back and forth a lot. And so it has huge changes in temperature on its outside of its body. And so these flippers, they have all kinds of little blood vessels close to the surface, 
and the whale can use those to help cool itself down or to help warm itself up. And these whales, they will dive down and then they blow bubbles through their blowhole. They'll start with a big ring of bubbles and somehow or another it acts like a net to these krill and they run away from the bubbles. And so they keep running toward the middle here and then they'll close the ring. They'll be swimming in tighter and tighter circles and he gets everything trapped in nothing but bubbles. And then he comes, swims right up through the middle from the underneath, opens up its big mouth, and it can grab a ton of the krill all at one time. And it's like an expert fisherman. It's incredible. Well, if evolution is true, how do these animals figure this out? Sperm whales dive really deep dives, 550 feet a minute. Let's say it's a 70-foot whale. You get an increase of one atmosphere about every 12 feet or so. And if he's 70 feet long, he might have three or four or five different amounts of atmosphere, a pressure on different parts of its body. And you would think that might just collapse the whale. But God built the whale so that it has different amounts of pressure on its blood vessels. And it has this powerful heart, which can weigh up to a ton pumping this blood out through all these arteries and veins, and uh, they can close off certain parts of their circulatory system so that maybe they need a little more inside pressure down here if they're diving straight down. They can more or less direct the pressure inside their body more down here. And when they're on the bottom feeding, they can almost shut everything down except their tail and their brain and their heart so they can eat and they don't burn a lot of energy while they're down there. Now, the sperm whale like to eat squid, giant squid, that are 40 feet long. And there are huge battles because many sperm whales, their skin is all scarred from the hooks on the, on the squid. Whales are highly social and have a sophisticated communication device that can enable them to communicate over hundreds of miles send out a sound wave, they'll locate large pods of prey, pools or schools of prey, and then they can home in on them and find them. It's actually what we designed a lot of our early sonar off of. Evolution teaches that whales are really a land mammal that decided to go back into the ocean. God made whales so that when they breathe through their blowhole, they do not uh, have any connection to their mouth. Now we have a connection between mammals have connections between the nose and the mouth. You can get a nose full of water and it can come down in your mouth. You can get stuff in your mouth and as little kids, it's always coming out the nose. With a whale, what, how are they gonna eat? They're gonna have to open their mouth and sometimes under large amounts of pressure, fill up their mouth to eat so their mouth and their nose aren't hooked up. How do you have a slowly evolving something into something else where you can't have a partially uh, unhooked up system? It's either totally unhooked up so that you can't drown, or it's, it's not. And uh, so I don't see any evidence that land mammals have migrated into the ocean and become whales and porpoises and dolphins and all those kinds of things. I, I, I don't think we have any evidence for that. Now here's a little bird that's got to be the world's greatest navigator. The Pacific Golden Plover is a shorebird which lives in the great Arctic North. Weighing only half a pound, it lays about four eggs that hatch in 24 days. After having its chicks, this bird embarks on a courageous and Herculean migration. How does evolution explain how a migratory animal gets from where he is in the summer to where he is in the winter? Usually the explanation is you have this certain kind of bird, and he grows in Texas. And then one winter, Texas is a cold winter. So he decides, you know something, I'm heading for Mexico. So he flies a, a few hundred miles south, and oh, it's a little nicer down here. And then he comes back to Texas in the summer, but it's an especially hot summer. So he decides, you know, I think I'm gonna go to Kansas. So he flies north, looking for a little cooler weather. And then each year, he might go a little further south, a little further north, until they get all the way up to the Arctic and all the way down in South America. Well, this little bird breaks that rule. First of all, it's a very small bird, about the size of a dove, and it's not a swimmer, and it lives up in the Arctic, 
in Alaska actually, they leave their young and then fly to Hawaii for the winter. Now, when it leaves Alaska, it has an 88 hour flight nonstop because there's no land in between. Three days and four nights nonstop. How does it do that? Well, these little birds uh, begin to eat a lot and they gain about 70 grams of burnable energy. And here's the problem. We got an 88 hour flight and they burn right at one gram per hour. Well, that only gives them 70 hours worth of fuel. So they're gonna drop into the ocean as non-swimmers a few hours short of Hawaii. Well, then how do they get there? Well, because God made them so they fly in formation and they alternate leaders and so they break the airwaves there so it makes it easy like geese fly in formation. And that cuts the energy that it takes to fly. It's not uncommon for birds of that size to lose 50% of their total body weight and that's fat being burned up along their migration routes. It's an incredible feat. Uh, if you can imagine a hundred pound human losing 50 pounds in a five day period as they traveled uh, across the world. It, it's just something that, that mammals can't do. And so only God could do that because the evolutionary explanation doesn't fit because there's no way they could go a little bit each year, a little bit further south, plop, they're fish bait. Okay, so they can't do it. So the evolutionary explanation doesn't work on them. There is another interesting thing, and that is uh, the, the parents have their eggs, the, the babies hatch, but then the parents fly to Hawaii. Now the young are here, and they're gonna keep eating and growing and great, gaining strength to get their 70 grams of fat built up, and then they take off for Hawaii, but they've never been there before. So how do they navigate? How do they know where to go? Nobody knows for sure. And if, if they miss it, even if some side wind would catch them and start blowing them off course, they still get there. And they can arrive at the exact same location every year within the, an area the size of this room. And they do this over thousands of miles. How do these animals get from here to there? The scientists are still trying to figure that out. Sa same thing with the homing pigeons. These little birds can find their way back home to their very spot where they, where they need to go uh, from almost anywhere in the world. Now, there are these huge areas that they've never flown over before. So they use many means and we don't even really know what they all are and how they do it, but when we take them out and release them, they'll circle for a while and get oriented and head for home. It's amazing. What, what is guiding them across these areas and what is built into them that God has done? I think that's the only way to describe this. God has made these little creatures so they can find their way over totally unknown territory to them. What a wonderful, magnificent thing our God has done. Oh, missed him. Those dragonflies are really fast. You ever wonder why they call them dragons? It's because of their fierce jaws. Check this out. The dragonfly is a remarkable hunter. It can swoop down on its prey at speeds over 20 miles per hour. Its wing design gives it incredible flying ability. And with eyes that can spot its prey at over 40 feet, very few will escape. A dragonfly. They live in the water as the larvae and they might be in the water for one to two years as larvae. And they're down there and they're eating little fish and they'll eat tadpoles. They are Tyrannosaurus rex. The top level carnivore in, in many water systems. They have this mouth part that is like nothing else. It kind of folds underneath and can ex be extruded and, and uh, capture um, anything that comes by. And you know, sometimes there's a bunch of tadpoles here, and here comes a, a dragonfly larva, and it catches one and eats it. And that little one that it is eating puts out some kind of a signal that makes the other tadpoles in the area turn a little different color so that they can swim faster and get away from a dragonfly larva. I mean, no way that evolution has the answer for those kinds of things. Dragonflies have the best eyes of, of any kind of insect, and there might be up to 30,000. They've got tiny facets. Each one takes in 
a little bit of light and a little bit of uh, image, and nothing comes close to that. Sikorsky, that invented the helicopter, it is said that he studied dragonflies and got his ideas for helicopters. Well, a dragonfly has two sets of wings, and the front set of wings, if he's flying forward, that will give him his lift, and the back set of wings gives him his propulsion, what pushes him. But they can fly backwards. And when a dragonfly flies backwards, now the back set of wings lifts and the front set of wings pushes. So he is absolutely reversing what the muscles do when he flies backwards, and he can do it in an instant. He can fly up, stop, and fly back. But the dragonflies, they've got muscles that are attached to each, each wing, and they use both pairs of wings independently, and they can swerve and maneuver and, and get the best of anybody who's ever tried to collect them. As far as I know, they're the only insect that when they turn, their whole body turns. So they're like, if they're flying straight, you look, their whole body's straight, their abdomen's straight. Now they're gonna bank around a turn. That means that the upper wings or the outside wings, compared to the inside wings on the curve, they're doing two different things now. So he's working his wings in two different ways on the opposite sides of his body. And the wings themselves. Why don't those little frail wings on a dragonfly just collapse? You can see right through them, they're like paper thin. God built little channels through those wings that might be one one hundredth of an inch. They add all kinds of strength to it. They have cells that are thicker at the tips of the wings so that when it is flying, the wings don't flutter. That's a miracle. I, I don't know how else to explain that. I think our Lord is amazing. Now, here's another enormous animal that spends a lot of time in the water. Its name actually means river horse, the hippopotamus. They may look placid and clumsy, but on land, the African hippo can weigh up to 7,000 pounds and can run 30 miles an hour. But hippos prefer the water where they walk gracefully across the bottom and linger to stay cool. Their skin is one half inch thick and has a remarkable system to keep it moist and protected from the African sun. Uh, some people think a hippopotamus uh, bleeds like sweat, is blood, it's red. But it has these glands in its skin that exude a pinkish, reddish fluid that when it's out of the water, it turns on these little glands and that puts this pinkish reddish fluid on its skin which acts as a, as a sun blocker and as a insect repellent. The red oil that they secrete actually helps fight skin infections. So when the bulls are sparring for territory and tearing each other up, it'll help prevent skin infections since they're living in such murky, mucky water. Where would that come from? I mean, how would that ability evolve? How many billions of years would it take for a hippopotamus to get those glands just right? While it looks peaceful and serene, don't be fooled. When threatened, the African hippo is said to have killed more people than any other animal in Africa. The hippo's jaw has incredible crushing power, and its teeth can be as long as 18 inches. One of the amazing things about hippos is their jaw. They have the largest mouth of any land animal. In fact, it's so large they can crush canoes. Hippos have been known to open their jaws 180 degrees. It's almost all the way back. A lot of times when they're yawning or just show, showing off that they're the top hippo in the area. Their ears, eyes, and nostrils sit on the top of their heads, uniquely designed, so the hippo can almost totally submerge in water, but keep a watchful eye on its surroundings. Hippos can stay underwater for about six minutes, and how they do it is they hold more oxygen in their blood, similar to a whale or dolphin. They can also sleep for hours underwater. They just raise their head up, take a breath, go back under, don't even wake up, just like you and I turning over in our sleep. Hippos are wonderful parents, and the females actually give birth in the water to keep the baby from falling and dying. Their herds usually range in number from 10 to 20, and these herds play host to a number of other creatures. There's certain types of little creatures that live in water that the only way they can be there is with the hippopotamus being in the water, and they put their excrement in the water, and these little creatures exist on that. There are some places in Africa where they have pools where the hippopotamus don't go there for some reason or other. And they're sterile. There's no life in those pools. 
And so all of these things are, in one way or another, dependent upon each other. In any event, these are just some more things that God has done. That There's so much that we could learn, so much more that we could learn about these things that God has made. I'm going to go into this cave where I hope to find some glow worms and fireflies. I have to turn on my light. Unlike me, these creatures make their own light. That light is cold light. We don't have anything like that. Scientists have not been able to figure out how to do that. They use 100% of their energy in the light. Like an incandescent light bulb for us is about 4% light, the rest is heat. So we're wasting 96% of the energy. Yet you have a glow worm or a kukaju beetle and the light is so bright that uh, natives down there in South America will make little baskets and have these kukajus and that's, that's their flashlights walking in the woods. The, the light is so bright. They have two, these two substances that they mix, luciferin and luciferase. Now luciferase, it's about 1,000 amino acids and the scientists have not been able to duplicate that enzyme. But yet here is a little insect that's supposed to not know anything about anything and supposed to have evolved from who knows what that has the ability to do something that we can't do. With all of our high-tech science, we can't do it. But why do these creatures create light? What purpose does the light have? And why do they flash these lights in what appears to be planned sequences? Scientists believe part of it has to do with finding their mate. Uh, some of these little bugs have an exact sequence of flashing their lights and they communicate with light. Another interesting thing, there's one group of these particular types of insects, and on a whole tree, every leaf will have one of these on, but they turn on like the whole tree, bang. All the bugs turn on their lights at exactly the same moment, and the scientists don't have the foggiest idea how they communicate to send the signal, okay, turn on the lights, and they all turn on. The light can be seen from a mile or more, just to light up areas along rivers in Southeast Asia and the like. A phenomenal event. Our God is he's amazing in the things that he has thought up. He started with nothing. I mean, we have all these things to work with. He started with absolutely nothing and thought all these things up and they work. I mean, that takes incredible genius and wisdom and power. And that's our God, the God of the Bible amazing little creatures. Did you know certain American Indians used to smear fireflies on their faces and chests as decorations? Scary. I just thought of something. I'm in a cave. It's winter time. Don't bears hibernate in caves in the winter time? The bears of North America are large, powerful creatures. Grizzlies can weigh up to 860 pounds, and polar bears over 1,300 pounds, and can run up to 30 miles per hour. But they also have an enormous appetite and spend most of their time foraging for food, building fat for hibernation. Here in hibernation, one of creation's unique miracles occur. The mothers have their baby bears, and they nurse those baby bears for up to five months. They never drink a drop of water. Well, where's all that fluid come from to nurse a baby bear for five months, sometimes seven months, when you're not drinking anything? What happens is, the bear is fat and when he goes into hibernation. The fat in the bear breaks down. Each gram of fat gives off a gram and a half of water, and that water goes back into the bear's system and that's how the mother makes the milk that she feeds the baby. She also doesn't go to the bathroom. And so her extra fluid is recycled. The bear has little factories inside itself that turn that into the proteins that it needs to nourish its body as it's going ahead and feeding its baby. Well, the scientists don't even know how it does that. Another mystery is how hibernating bears preserve their muscle strength. Bears lose only 20% of their strength during this five months of hibernation. 
Now, if you put a human in a bed for five months, we lose 90% of our muscle strength. Our muscles just deteriorate. Even in a month, they just deteriorate. If a lion was to come after a bear right after he walked out of hibernation, he could fight that lion, and he is strong. So recently, they've done some experiments, and they hook some instruments up to a bear in hibernation, and they've discovered that bears go into violent chills, and they'll tense up their muscles, and now they think maybe it's like isometric exercises, that the bear keeps its strength all through the winter by tensing its muscles. And it's like God built that into the bear so that it could protect itself and take care of itself and protect its young right away as soon as it comes out of hibernation. I think that's fascinating. Uh, the God of the Bible has he's thought of every single angle in every single way. Uh, he is unmatchable. <sighs> wow, waking a bear with cubs? They can be a real bear. Oh, hey, look. Here's a creature that doesn't have any problem finding a meal because all they eat is dirt. To an earthworm, the whole world is just one giant smorgasbord. But actually, earthworms are a lot more incredible than you might think. The common earthworm can consume one third of their body weight in a single day. They have no eyes, but are sensitive to vibrations, and they come in all sizes. Now there's an earthworm in Australia, one inch, a little more than an inch in diameter, and grows to be like 10 to 12 feet long. It looks like a snake. The average earthworm, after about a year, is probably six to eight inches long. We used to catch them when I was a boy to use to go fishing. But if you try to grab them, they can go in reverse. So they can not only crawl forward, they can go in reverse and pull back into their hole. Well, that's marvelous. They basically turn over the earth, aerate the earth, and fertilize the earth. And you would say, well, how do they, how do, they do that? Well, an earthworm literally spits on the dirt in front of it, and that softens it up. And if it can't push through, it'll just eat it. And its nose comes to a, just a point, a fine point. They'll stick it in the finest little crack and then they want to start pushing into that crack to expand the dirt. So they have uh, little organs inside themselves that push out. And they can literally push out 1.54 atmospheres somebody measured. Then, in order to push in, they have little anchors. When they're crawling, those anchors might be hidden, tucked in little tucks. But when they want to move, they pop those out and then in segments, they expand and contract here, and they can move ahead, pull them in, that way they can move. When you actually tug on a worm, those hairs will come out and like anchor itself in the ground. I read a couple places where some evolutionists are talking about earthworms, and these little anchors that they shoot out on their sides are like little tufts of hair. And so they say that the primordial earthworms were evolving along and they're, they're losing their fur coat. Why would an earthworm need a fur coat in the, in the first place? And secondly, where's the evidence for that? All they have are these little things that have a function, they pull them along. Uh, why do we have to say they must have come from something that had a fur coat? Moles under the, under the ground will eat these little earthworms and many times the mole will bite off their head because once they bite off their head, they don't crawl, but they can stay alive. And so they'll stay alive down there, and then over the winter months, the mole will eat them, but some of them, he doesn't get around to eating. And in time, it regenerates its head, and then it can just crawl away. And they actually have the ability to squeeze off those muscles and give the tail instead of the whole, whole thing, and then regenerate. So what a, what a marvelous little thing an earthworm is, that God made it so that you can chop it in three pieces and it can regenerate itself, even its head. Here's an animal, the largest land animal on earth. Elephants can get to be up to 11,000 pounds and while they may be big, they certainly aren't dumb. Elephants are some of the smartest animals around. There are two types of elephants some that come from Africa, and the others from India. To tell them apart, all you have to do is check out their ears. The African elephant is the one with the big ears, 
and then the Asian has the smaller ears. But that's their air conditioning system because they don't have sweat glands. And so they get hot, and in order to get rid of the heat, uh, they'll fan their ears. And God built them with blood vessels all through the surfaces of their ears. If you ever look at an elephant's ear and you see the veins in back, you can see that some of them are about an inch across, which is quite large, so it can handle a large amount of blood. And they can cool off as much as 10 degrees in a short period of time. The elephant's trunk, while looking rather odd and unusual, give the elephant a powerful and versatile tool for eating, bathing, and work. With its trunk, the elephant, first of all, it can smell, has incredible uh, smelling ability. It drinks with its trunk, it fills it up with water, several gallons. Their trunk has six major muscle groups, but there's about 100,000 muscle units. An elephant can lift uh, a 500-pound log, but it is so sensitive with that trunk that it can gently take a little thing out of the hand of a child. And a trunk can weigh 300 pounds. So you have a 300-pound trunk, and then tusks can weigh up to 200 pounds each. So he's got 400 pounds of tusk, he's got 300 pounds of trunk, and yet his head, the bone, is very porous. It's like God made his head so at least he didn't have to worry about a heavy bone type head. You, you wouldn't call him a bonehead, I guess, because it's very porous. So God made them that way to compensate for their size. If you look at the bones in the foot of an elephant, it's almost like God made a joke because the elephant on the bones is walking on his tiptoes. And so here you have this huge animal tiptoeing around. Now you can't tell that by looking at his foot because he has this huge fat pad and this fibrous tissue that he really walks on. Weighing 10,000 pounds, that can put a lot of wear and tear on your bones. So they have a big cushion between the pad of their foot, which is the bottom of their foot, and the bones of their feet. And he can walk silently. His feet are designed so that even a twig, if it snaps under his foot, it's muffled. And so he can walk almost silently. Many times elephants are walking along water holes and along rivers and they will sink into the mud on the banks. And they can sink in three and four feet. You're thinking, this might be like a boot. How are they gonna get it out, you see? Well, God made the elephant's legs so that as he begins to pull up on his leg, when it's surrounded with like dirt, mud, it decreases in diameter. And so it becomes a smaller leg and a smaller foot. And that way he can just, he doesn't have any problem at all. Elephants live in close family groups and are excellent parents. They will fiercely guard their new calves, who can weigh 200 pounds at birth. While elephants have a long lifespan, they also seem to have a long memory. Elephants in Africa have been watched for many years, certain ones, they, they live to be very old, 60, 70 years old, and uh, maybe one of them will die. And it's almost like they come and pay homage They'll come and they'll hang around and their faces take on a sad look. And then maybe two years later, one of the elephants will come walking back by the spot where that elephant died and maybe there's some of the bones left. And it's like they, they have a silent moment of prayer. The whole idea that ideas have consequences Look at our culture. Look at what's taught in our schools, our universities. Uh, we even have things that are taught that aren't even true. And they're known to be not true. There are things like uh, Heckel's embryo pictures that are still in current textbooks. And there's all these little embryo pictures of horse and cow and pig and, and human, and they all look exactly alike. Well, that was proven to be a fraud back in about 1884, and it's still in the textbooks. And then you have things like the peppered moth. Well, what's going on here? You've got these peppered moths that are growing on these trees, living on these tree trunks. And during the Industrial Revolution, apparently the tree trunks got covered with dust. And now all of a sudden the birds can't see these light colored ones. They just kind of blend in, but they're eating all the dark colored ones. And that just proves natural selection. Well, the fact is that whole thing was a fraud. Those, those, those moths don't even grow on tree trunks. 
They don't land on tree trunks. They live up in the top of the trees. And so the birds can't be eating them off the tree trunks when they don't even land on tree trunks. And so those pictures are still in the textbooks. Okay, by the way, that was exposed in 1999 publicly. And so we have a, a system of delusion that is propagated out there that most people don't know and they don't even know. But there's some people that do know and they just keep doing it. When we have people like Carl Sagan that go on television and they'll say, evolution is no longer a theory, it is a proven fact. That is baloney and he knew that, but that's called propaganda. When, when a distinguished man with a PhD degree and a white lab coat gets him up in front of the average Joe six pack and says, we have proven evolution is true with our science. Well, first of all, he's not talking science because you can't prove macro evolution with science. It is more a philosophy. The fact is evolution is not a proven fact. Sparrows are one of the most common birds in the world, but as a flyer, the sparrow has few equals. We have a little sparrow, and he's flying through the air, and it looks so easy, and yet they can fly through a tree or a bush with sticks and leaves, and they never hit anything. They dodge and fly and weave, and they are able to tell those feathers. We need an adjustment here. For instance, when they are just flying normally, and let's say a little bit of a side wind catches them, they can adjust the feathers on their wings even one degree. They can turn those feathers, they can raise the feathers, lower the feathers. All of that is hooked in to their brain. And they can adjust different feathers, different degrees. Feathers are the, some of the strongest strength to weight ratio materials known to man, stronger than steel. Evolution teaches that feathers came from scales because birds came from reptiles. Does that look like a result of scales that have no muscles, they have no follicle, uh, the, the, whole, the, work, the whole works peels off. There's no relationship there. If they came from reptiles, you would expect their bones to be like reptile bones. They're nothing like reptile bones. They have little air pockets through them. They even can carry uh, air in like lungs in their bones. Their bones are lightweight and uh, made for flying. Every, you look at a, at a sparrow, it is made to fly. Man has never been able to approach the, uh, the efficiency of, of birds in terms of the ability to fly with, with our airplanes and, and other machines. Its heart is so efficient it can beat up to 760 beats per minute. Everything about its design has captured the curiosity and imagination of flight engineers for years. It has a very short digestive system with very concentrated digestive juices because you can't have a whole lot of weight on the bird or it won't fly. So it has to eat and then digest it quickly and then get rid of its waste. All that had to be figured out and thought through in the design of the bird, just like in the design of the, of the firefly or in the design of the dragonfly. Another thing about sparrows and birds, they have what's called their brooding spot. And when they're about to lay their eggs, God made them special that way because they don't have to carry all that extra weight of those eggs when they're flying. And down here on their breast area, are these little feathers and downy things and they begin to come off and they'll use some of those to line the nest but it leaves bare skin and that skin is fascinating because the blood vessels in the skin multiply there's like seven times more than normal they get to be five times as big and then when that skin touches those eggs somehow there is a communication that takes place from the egg through the brooding spot to the brain of the little bird and it might say, our eggs down here, they're a little too warm. And so the bird will go off the eggs for a while. Or it might say, we have too much moisture. And so there's ways that the bird handles that. And that communication comes through that brooding spot. Penguins actually incubate eggs on the top of their feet. They put the egg on their feet so they can keep it off the ice and snow. And then they fold a, a patch of of belly, skin, and feathers over the egg and completely encase it on top of their feet. But it's a very sophisticated mechanism for, for keeping the, con 
the temperature under direct control for the developing embryo in the egg. How would that evolve? If you did not have that in the bird with the very first egg that the bird laid, that egg would just sit there and, and die. This is back to the irreducible complexity idea. All the parts have to be there from the very beginning or you just don't have the creature. You don't have the brooding spot, you don't have the eggs. You don't have the ability to make the egg, then you're not going to be able to fly if all that stuff is inside of you. And so God has thought of all these different angles and adjustments that needed to be made to his creation to keep it working efficiently and effectively and, and wondrously. Sparrows are incredible flyers. Speaking of flying, there's a flying machine. When you look at that plane, it seems clear that someone or a design team designed it for flight. But when some people consider the way incredible creatures function, it seems strange to me that, that they don't acknowledge that same principle. When you look at these amazing animals and insects, it's clear that they were remarkably and carefully designed. As we look at these things, it should make us think, you know, I see design here. Uh, you know, I, I, I see some art here. I see some sort of a creation here. I see something that looks like it's been made. It doesn't look like it's just a mindless, random chance process that has produced this thing. So that is general revelation. We look at the things God has made. That should make us think about who is the maker. Who is the designer? Who is the artist? Who is the creator? That should drive us into the Bible, which is called special revelation. And then that is going to tell us about this God who tells us he did create it all, just like he says, but it's more than that. He created each one of us. So the creator stepped into his creation in the person of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ, the creator, who did his miracles here on earth, uh, to prove that he was God. He could do things that we can't do. I have people tell me, I am God. I say, okay, prove it. Let me see you walk on water. Well, you know, I can't do that. Well, let me, let me see you create a planet. Well, I can't do that. Well, then you're not God, but I know God. I know somebody can do that. His name is Jesus. And he stepped into his creation as a man who was 100% man, 100% God, and then he died on a cross to take the penalty for your sin and my sin. It says that God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so that means there is a provision for my sin and the sins of all mankind. Well, what is the provision? It's the death and the resurrection of Christ. So what do I have to do to have my sin forgiven? I have to put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal savior. I can pray, I can ask God to forgive me of my sin. And he wants to know us and he wants us to know him. Matter of fact, that's the whole purpose of the creation. So that he could have people, we are the highest thing in his created order, we're created in the image of God, and he wants us to fellowship with him. He wants us to worship him and praise him and give thanks to him because the God who created everything, all these incredible creatures that defy evolution, he created them, he created you, he wants to have relationship with you, that's why he created you. And so why not have a relationship with him? through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there you have it. We are surrounded by creatures that are, well, incredible. So the next time you look around this amazing world, just know it was no accident. I'm David Hames. I'll see you next time.